everybody. I hope you're doing okay. Brandon had asked me to share in a time of prayer with you guys. So if you will, bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you that we're able to call you Father. We thank you for your love for us and for your provision and your protection during these difficult times. God, we thank you that your grace is sufficient to meet our needs. Lord, we just thank you that uh, even when it seems like our faith is running on fumes sometimes, that you remain faithful and that you are with us um, and that we're never alone. God, we just thank you that you're using these difficult times to revive our hearts and restore our souls. I pray for each and every one of the youth in the youth group that um, even though we're not able to meet physically together right now, that you are still help, helping them to stay in the word and that they are growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray a special prayer over our seniors that you would just bring them comfort and that you would just help them to know how much they are loved. I pray that they would come out of these challenging times changed that they would have their hearts even more so inclined, God, to share the love of Jesus with their community and with their world. I pray that our seniors would go forward with a great hope for their future and that they would know that they are never alone and that whether they're staying close to home or whether they're going far away to college, that you are always with them. And I just pray um, that you would keep their hearts steadfast towards you, that they would seek your kingdom above anything else that they might pursue in this life. I just pray your richest blessings over them and their families as they try to celebrate this milestone um, during these unusual circumstances. And God, finally, I just want to thank you for your word and your promises. Lord, that we would just hide these um, greatest treasures in our hearts, Lord, so that during difficult times like these, that we can trust and know the depth of your love for us. And we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you're staying well and staying safe, and we hope that we will see you in person very, very soon. Hey guys, welcome to THFBC Youth Group Online. So glad you're with me here today. We are going to be looking at Ephesians 4, verses 31 through 33. These are the last two verses that Paul gives us uh, as he talks about what it means to put on the new you. Um, it's all over the Bible, this idea of us becoming new. Even in the Old Testament, it talks about how we'll be given a new heart, right? And a new... Uh, God's going to remove the heart of, of, of stone and give us a heart of flesh. Like he's going to give us a new heart complete with new desires uh, and new motivation to uh, on how to live. Uh, it's in the Old Testament. And even Jesus talks about it in the New Testament when he, in John 3 when he says, No one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless they are born again. Uh, this idea of being born again means you are regenerated. Like you, you're given this brand new life to live. Like Jesus talks about that. Um, he was, and, and John says that we, we are born of the Spirit, uh, which there's a lot to that. But what it's really talking about is how uh, the Holy Spirit will transform our, our lives and dwell within us. Paul says we're temples of the Holy Spirit. Uh, John says we've passed. In 1 John, he talks about how we've passed from death into life. Like there's this huge regeneration, this huge transformation that happens. And that passage we talk about in 1 Corinthians uh, a couple of weeks ago, Paul says you've been made new. The, the, the new is here. The old has passed away. The Bible is just covered in this idea uh, it covers this idea a lot that we are new and we've been made new. And uh, we have the ability to live a new life. And that doesn't mean that we don't struggle or trip. Uh, James says we all stumble in many ways. Um, we do. We, we sin. We, we, we fall into temptation. We trip. Um, no doubt we fight this battle of sin. And temptation each day, because in Romans seven Paul says, um, "I want to do good, 
but evil is right there beside me. And he is so right. Every day we are tempted by things, uh, different, different sins, different temptations, you know, maybe, and, and typically they're for selfish reasons. So, so yes, we battle sin, but at the exact same time, the Bible is pounding in our heads this idea that if we trusted in Jesus, we really are new and we have the freedom to live a new life with Jesus. That's the bottom line. And so when we look at Ephesians 4, verse 31, Paul says, get rid of, get rid of certain things, right? That's what it means to take off the old self. And then he says, become like this in verse 32. And we look at that and go, well, that sounds daunting for me to take certain things out of my life and put on different things or be a different way. And oftentimes we think, I feel like a lot of Christians, and the reason why I think that's daunting for a lot of Christians is because, maybe it's because we're living in failure mode where we've bought into the lie that we can't change, that God's grace and power and spirit in our lives can't change us. And that is a lie. He can change us. He's already changed us. And now we actually do have the freedom to live a new life. Uh, we have the ability to change. And, and so that's why Paul starts off in verse 31 by saying, get rid of all bitterness. He says, stop thinking. Get, get rid of could be thought of as saying, just stop thinking that way. Change how you think. Change and control the way your emotions go. Don't just let them run wild. Think. Don't get, get rid of these thoughts that often control your day and your life. He says get rid of, number one is bitterness. Uh, this is part of taking off the old life and putting on the new life is, with Jesus is we shed bitterness. Bitterness is a pretty dangerous thing. I don't know if we really realize that, but bitterness can just consume your thoughts. It can become the one thing you worship because bitterness is when you, res when you, when you feel like you've been treated unfair or you've been wronged by somebody to the point where you're never going to recover and it's just, it's all their fault and I hate them for it. And, 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 and bitterness is one of those things where it, it, it takes over. It's just like I've been cooking a lot here recently. And uh, I, put, I learned to put chicken in a bag with some marinade before I put it on the grill. And the longer I leave that chicken in the marinade, um, the more that chicken absorbs and becomes more and more saturated and marinated so that if I, if I left that chicken in there long enough and took it out and washed it off, the marinade has, has it, it, it's just because I wash it off the outside of the chicken, see, it doesn't really matter because that marinade has seeped into every, every molecule of that chicken. And in a lot of ways, that's bitterness. Bitterness doesn't, it starts with a thought. He wronged me, I'll never, oh, I'm so angry and... I'm so bitter at him for what he did to me or what he said to me or what she she did that was she just totally hurt me, you know. Bitterness is when we take that thought and we run with it. And it ends up consuming our life because we go, there's no way I'll recover from that from from being treated unfair. And it's all their fault. And we have to be careful with that. Because that can damage relationships. That can take over our thinking. I know a, a lot of people where bitterness has just simply consumed them and how they think. And, all this, and now they're the victim. It's everybody else's fault. And, and So bitterness is something we really have to let go of. And it's why Paul says, look, putting on the new you means getting rid of bitterness. 
You know, maybe some of the bitter things you hold on to right now is, is as a student, maybe you feel like you deserve more freedom than your parents allow you to have. And it causes you to be bitter. It leads to bitterness day in and day out. That's something that we can't dwell on. That's something that we need to resolve with our parents. That's, that's something we need to share and talk about and discuss and, and deal with it with our parents. Out in the open. Remember, Paul's already told us last, last week or um, two weeks ago about how to deal with anger. Uh, and he says, don't, don't, in your anger, don't sin, right? But, and also, don't let the sun go down before you, you deal with that anger. See, you're supposed to deal with, it's okay to be angry. It's okay because we live in a sinful world. There's going to be conflict, but the deal is, is deal with it quickly. Deal with it in a healthy way. Don't turn bitter and unwilling to resolve the conflict. That's what Paul's getting at. So he says, get rid of bitterness because that damages relationships and it inhibits uh, your focus, which should be on Jesus. So he goes on, he says, get rid of bitterness and rage. Rage meaning like Hulk-like behavior. You've seen the Hulk. When Bruce Banner turns into the Hulk, he just, he gets out of control. And he starts raging in a way that he's not really thinking about the consequences. He's, you know, once he throws that guy, there's no taking it back. You know, he's already, the damage has been done. And when he turns back into Bruce Banner, Bruce looks around and he sees all the carnage that he caused because he stopped thinking and just simply acted on every, every angry thought he had. And, and so the point is, again, Dealing with bitterness so that it doesn't turn into rage. So that it doesn't turn and it doesn't get to the point where it's unbearable. And, uh, and, and you throw caution to the wind and you just go, I don't care what anybody thinks of me. I'm just going to call them up and yell at them. And, and you don't even think about the consequences and how that might affect the, your future relationship. You know, get rid of bitterness. Deal with rage before it gets to that point. Don't turn into the Hulk. Anger. Get rid of all anger. Anger means anger. And then he says brawling, which 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 actually doesn't mean like a brawl, like a fight, but he's talking about, um, when he says brawling, he's talking about shouting. Just shouting at the top of your lungs. It kind of goes along with the rage thing. Uh, just having, just losing, just allowing yourself to lose all control. Uh, in when you're angry, he says, make sure you deal with things before it gets to that point. Uh, slander, when you again, when you throw caution to the wind and you just say, I don't care, and, and you start using God's name in a flippant way, slander means like blaspheming God. When you when you just use God's name in, in the most careless way possible, um, and then lastly. Uh, every form of malice. Malice is, is evil. Evil thoughts, evil things, evil actions. He says, throw all that off. Get rid of every single bit. Do, do your best to get rid of every single evil in your life so that you can live as best you can this new life with Jesus which brings life and health and, and joy and peace. But all of these things Paul's mentioning that we need to remove from our life, those things have to go because they're not going to help you and they're not going to help anyone. Bitterness has to go. You got to deal with bitterness. Go and resolve that conflict. That'll, that'll get rid of the big bitterness because you can find common ground. You can, you can forgive. You can move on. And, and things can begin to heal, and relationships can be restored. So bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, every form of malice, those things need to go. And remember, when God gives us a command, what he's saying is you can do this. You, you actually have the ability to take these things out of your life. Otherwise, I wouldn't have made it a command. So getting rid of these things is possible. It's freeing it's healthy. 
to, to deal with that type of anger that way. Get rid of it. Don't let it get to that point. Don't let it escalate to that point. Deal with it before it gets bad. You want the sun go down uh, before you deal with that conflict. Deal with it while before the sun goes down. Deal with it that day. Uh, and then, so get rid of these things, but now here's what we need to become. He says, be every day. As long as it just, every single day, he says, be kind. Be kind. Be kind to one another, which there's no surprise there. Um, he says, be uh, compassionate. Be kind and compassionate. Compassion requires us to think of others. Compa in order for us to be compassionate, with somebody else, we have to think about what they're dealing with uh, and how they feel and what's going on in their life. We can't, you know, being in uh, being inconsiderate and not caring about others. What brings a person to that point is they they're not they don't think that that person's going through anything. They're not they're 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 totally oblivious to maybe the pain or the difficulty or the stuff that's going on in their life. They're just thinking about their, their own personal life. They're not thinking about how so-and-so is doing or whatever. So being compassionate means being considerate. Being compassionate means being considerate of others. This is how Jesus is with us, right? Jesus is compassionate. He's kind to us. Which is why Paul says putting on the new you means being kind and compassionate to one another. It's being, being like Jesus. And then here he says something really, really, really good. He says forgiving each other. Forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. He says forgive. Keeping in mind that Jesus has already forgave you for so much. I mean, think about it. When Christ died on the cross for our sins, he died to pay for every single sin you will commit, you, that, that you will ever commit for your entire life. Jesus paid for all of that in full, completely on the cross. All of your past, present, and future sins. Jesus paid for it. So, if God, if our Savior, if our Lord has that kind of love, kindness, compassionate, and forgiveness for us, then as his followers, as God's children, we should be forgiving just as he is forgiving. As a matter of fact, to not forgive others um, could mean that we really don't understand the, um, how, how much love and kindness and compassion that God has for us. and how I don't think we've really personalized what Christ did when he forgave us on the cross. I don't think we really realize it if we're unwilling to forgive others. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 14 through 15, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's how Jesus lays it out in Matthew 6. Now, here's a couple things. Here's what Jesus is not saying. Jesus is not saying that if we don't forgive the right amount or we don't forgive perfectly other people that we uh, are saved. That, that's not what Jesus is getting at here. Um, but what he is saying, that if we truly understand what God has done for us and how he has forgiven us of our sins, then that should show up 
in how we forgive others in our life. That should show up. Now, I know we aren't perfect. I know we make mistakes. I know at times we are s selfish and, and we, we do intentionally bad things and, and God still completely forgives us. And, and I know that's how we are. And I know we're sinners but God has forgiven us of our sins, and so we should forgive others. And, and maybe that forgiveness is a process for you. Maybe it takes time for you to give someone, depending on what they've done to you. I'm not saying that that's not the case. And, and, and so when we look at forgiveness, we have to understand that forgiveness is freedom. Not just for, we're not just freeing the people who have hurt us, but we are freeing ourselves from dwelling on the wrong that's been done to us. Again, there's a reason why Jesus says, vengeance is mine, thus says the Lord. God is going to make every wrong right. That's not, that's not our job. Our job is, our, our, our job description as disciples of Jesus is to forgive. And, and if we, I, I would say the, the huge problem would be is if you are so unwilling to forgive, you actually enjoy not forgiving that person. I'll never forgive them. I hate them so much. I wish they were. See, that type of thinking, thinking is bad. Uh, and you need to watch that. Um, uh, Matthew um, 18, I believe it is, Jesus uh, gives a story about a, a, a servant, a guy who owed his master money, and he, he owed a lot of money to him. And the master actually says, uh, it's okay. You, I'm going to just absorb all of your debt. I'm going to take care of all of it. You go, you are freed from that debt, you're completely pardoned, completely forgiven, go in peace. And that servant was, was so happy. This is Matthew 18, verse 21 through 35. And then a little later, uh, that same servant uh, gets outraged and begins choking one of these other servants that he, he, he knows who, who owed him like $10. And, and, and the servant, he was so angry, he was so resentful, he was so bitter. He, the forgiveness that the master had shown him did not matter at all to him. And the master goes, and, and actually the, the servant takes the other servant who owed him money, throws him in jail until he can pay him back. And when the master finds out about this, he's like, you wicked servant. You know, like, like, how could you not forgive after, after all that I forgave you for? It was clear that this servant really didn't understand. He hadn't personalized uh, the forgiveness that the master had given him. In the same way, we must forgive. It's the only key to freedom. It's the only way uh, that we can we can forgive and be freed from the bitterness and the pain. Forgiveness is the beginning of that. And we're able to do that because of uh, what God has done for us. And, and again, that doesn't mean that forgiveness isn't a process. That doesn't mean that uh, we have to somehow have perfect forgiveness. That doesn't even mean we have to forget what that person has done for us. But it does mean we lift that burden off of ourselves when we say, I forgive you. As much as it hurts me, I forgive you. Um, that's what God has commanded us to do. Um, and is it easy? No. Is it simple? Uh, sometimes not so much. 
Uh, but it's what God has commanded us to do. And so when we look at passages like this, where it says, forgive others, just as in Christ God forgave you, we forgive. And we say, God, you know best. And I trust you uh, with that. All right, guys, take care. I will see you later, and I am praying for you. Everybody head to small groups. All right, bye-bye.